coming to you. We are going through the Lord's Prayer, and uh, we have reached this evening uh, with the prayer, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I just want to read the context of verses 5 to 15 of Matthew chapter 6. Let's hear the word of God, the word of Christ. So Jesus said, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, may God bless his word to our hearts. And to that phrase in the Lord's Prayer, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' teaching on prayer is so clear so succinct and yet so profound. Jesus calls us to pray to our Father in heaven. What a privilege that is to call God in heaven Father. And we've seen in our studies that we are to, to ascribe to him the glory which is due to him as we say, hallowed be your name. The chief end of prayer is God's glory. That is what we are about as we pray. But as we seek God's glory in prayer, we must pray, your kingdom come. For truly, if he is to be glorified, we must pray that his kingdom will be revealed and established more intensively and extensively in terms of the church. But ultimately, of course, uh, the kingdom of God is seen and, and revealed and established supremely when Christ returns. What a day that will be. So even so, come, Lord Jesus, is what we pray. But in order for God's kingdom to come, and in order for God to be glorified, Jesus also brings us another petition to pray. And we've mentioned this a few times. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is another simple, seemingly straightforward, yet far-reaching prayer, which in addition to seeking God's glory and his kingdom coming, ought to transform our prayer lives. We are to pray for God's will to be done. But what is God's will that is a massive question for us to try and answer on a sunday evening but though it's a massive question we do need and it's important for us to focus in on what jesus means concerning the will of god that we should pray for i mean when we think about the will of God, we can first of all maybe think of God's will in terms of his decree, his eternal decree, his eternal plan and purpose. And the, the Baptist Confession of Faith really helps us uh, to just get to grips with what the, the biblical teaching uh, is on this. It says, for 
all, from all eternity, God decreed all that should happen in time, and this he did freely and unalterably, consulting his own wise and holy will. Yet in so doing, he does not become, in any sense, the author of sin, nor does he share responsibility for sin with sinners. Neither by reason of his decree is the will of any creature whom he is made violated, nor is the free working of second causes put aside. Rather is it established. In all these matters, the divine wisdom appears, as also does God's power and faithfulness in effecting that which he has purposed. And these are huge things for us, for finite, limited human beings to think of the eternal plan and purpose of God, and God performing his will according to his purpose here upon this earth. And although it's right to pray concerning this eternal decree of God, as we're already urged to do so in terms of praying your kingdom come, and although God uses the prayers of his people to accomplish that purpose, yet we must see that in these terms, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. God's eternal plan is being rolled out. It is being accomplished. And nothing can thwart that eternal decree of God. He even uses the wicked acts of his enemies, as we mentioned in prayer, to accomplish his purposes. Even the death of Christ upon the cross, wicked men put him there. They planned and purposed. They plotted and schemed. They crucified the Son of God. But yet God, according to his eternal plan, use their wicked hands to accomplish our salvation. What a wonderful thing that is. What a great God we worship. And so really we must see that that is not the particular focus of this petition. For secondly, we can think of God's will in terms of his revealed will. That will that God has made plain in the Bible That moral will, in terms of his commands and instructions and the principles that he has given mankind and his people. It is his will, really, that Jesus has been outlining in the Sermon on the Mount and will continue to do so after this passage on prayer. It is God's commands, God's purposes, God's righteousness revealed to us. Well, we can illustrate this. A friend from Wales here. Um, well, the, the Welsh Government have announced that it is their will that in built-up areas there will be a 20 mile an hour limit. That is the will of the Welsh Government. Now, will that be accomplished? Well, some might fulfil that will. But perhaps many won't fulfill that will. But that is their will. That is their command, as it were, to uh, the Welsh people, uh, folk living in Wales, uh, driving in Wales, that you keep that 20 mile an hour limit. And so as we think upon God, and as we see his revealed will for us, we wonder, well, what is that will? What has God said? What has God commanded us? What is God's will for my life? And we find it's here. It's in the Bible. That is God's revealed will to us. Herein we find the commands of God, the truth of God, and that will that he desires to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's this will that we are to pray to be done. For the truth is, as it will be the case with the 20 mile an hour limit in Wales, the truth is that this will is not being done by many on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, yes, this will is being done by the purified souls of God's people as well as the angels of heaven. This will is being perfectly, readily and unceasingly accomplished in heaven. What an awesome thing that will be. And you and I, who are Christians, by the grace of God, we will be in that position, doing the will of God perfectly one day. But it's so difficult for us to comprehend now, isn't it? Because the simple truth 
is that many fail upon this earth. Even we, it's true, isn't it? We fail to do God's will upon this earth now. And so Jesus calls us to pray that this will of God might be done on earth even as it is done in heaven. We are to pray this for the world around us. We are to pray this for our nation. We are to pray this particularly for the church and for the members of of the church. It's really the latter two that I, I want us to, to focus on in terms of praying this prayer. Uh, lead, uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we, before we try and unpack this a bit more, we need to be upfront and honest and say that this is perhaps the most difficult prayer to pray. We will not find it easy to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's really because of the very nature of that prayer. That God's will might be done in my church, in my life. And that's going to be difficult. With three, three reasons why it is difficult. Firstly, it's contrary to human nature. We read in Romans chapter 7 and verse 15 onwards the battle in the heart of the Christian. For Paul says, For what I am doing I do not understand, for what I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills wills to do good for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members O wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord and we identify with Paul's frustration we feel that at times just get so frustrated uh, with ourselves and uh, with uh, that indwelling sin which we so often fail to overcome. And that's the issue. This is why it's hard to pray your will be done in our own lives because indwelling sin, the old man, shouts and screams at this will of God. The old man tussles with it, with every fibre of its being, so that we would not fulfil God's will. Yes, the old man is an unwelcome companion as we strive towards holiness. And so our old nature will seek to turn us away from praying this prayer. But in Christ, by his Spirit, this also reveals to us the great need to pray this prayer. If there's such a battle going on, how much more we need to pray so that our old man might be put to death, that old sinful life might be killed off so that we would will to do God's will. But it's also difficult because it's contrary to human comfort. I mean, who wants a comfortable life? And we, Yeah, we want a comfortable life, don't we? So many adverts tend to pander towards this. If you have this product, well, your life's going to be so much better. Whatever it is, and ladies' car to the bar of chocolate. Yeah, your life's going to be brilliant, more comfortable. And that's what so many people want. We want a smooth, a peaceful, and a restful life with no problems. However, if we commit ourselves to praying for God's will to be done in our lives, then this will inevitably involve sacrifice, trouble, 
and even pain as we follow Christ. Let us go back to the Garden of Gethsemane where we uh, started at the, almost at the beginning of our service. There in Luke 22, we read our Lord Jesus praying. And he says in verse 42, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel strengthened him from heaven, uh, uh, appeared from heaven to, to strengthen him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He was in anguish. He was distressed of soul, as uh, uh, Matthew's gospel puts it. He is, is struggling and wrestling with this. But he says, not my will, but yours be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's praying this prayer that he had taught his disciples many months before. But what did it mean for Jesus to pray this prayer? It meant the cross. It meant the ultimate sacrifice. For him as the Messiah, it was the revealed will of God to go to that cross and lay down his life for his people. What a costly prayer it was to pray, your will be done. For he knew the agony of the cross. He knew what it would be to bear the punishment of the sin of his people. But yet he dared to pray that. And he walked the way of that prayer. And so as we pray, your will be done, it will mean a cost to us, things that we'll have to deal with and give up. It will mean perhaps persecution uh, in the workplace, in our family, wherever we are, because we are seeking to live a godly life for Christ and all who are godly will suffer persecution, the scriptures tell us. But will you dare to pray that? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's also a difficult prayer to pray because it's contrary to common practice. It's a general, generalization, of course, but what is a common practice and attitude of prayer that we can easily fall into? It's this, praying, my will be done on earth by heaven. Isn't that the way many prayers come? Lord, do my will. We want to get God's will conform to our will. We want God to do what we want. And so, in many people's minds, we can pray and twist God's arm to get him to do what we want to do. We find this in verse 7 of, of Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 6, uh, where Jesus says, When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. So that they babble on with loads of words, perhaps many repetitions, and uh, thinking that through that they can twist God's arm to do what they want, he, he, what they want him to do. Is your prayer life like that? Are you praying, my will be done on earth by heaven? It's hard to break that, isn't it? To break such a habit and pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But even though it is a very difficult prayer to pray, Yet our kind, wise Master and Saviour calls us to pray it because it's best for us. It is God's will that we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we pray this prayer? In what practical ways can we pray this prayer? We've got four things, uh, four ways in which we should practically pray this prayer. Firstly, pray for the desire to pray this prayer. You might think that's a bit of a twisted argument, but 
it is important to pray for the desire to pray this prayer because it is so difficult because it is contrary to human nature to human comfort and common practice we must pray for an overwhelming desire to do god's will and glorify him in this manner we must pray that we may know the spirit of christ in union with christ so that it will be our basic desire to do god's will and to pray this prayer for wasn't this the very essence of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find in Hebrews chapter 10 that the reference to Christ in fulfilling and taking to heart uh, the words of Psalm 40. And we read in Hebrews 10 verse 5, Therefore when he, that is Christ, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Christ's desire was to fulfill God's will, even to redeem us from our sin. So surely we must pray that as redeemed sinners, we would long for the same. We would pray that God's will might be be done according to his word. But secondly, we must pray that we may know God's will in the scriptures. In Psalm 119 and verses 97 to 104, uh, we read this. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. A true understanding and true wisdom comes from God's word. For here we do see God's will revealed to us. I remember many years ago, she was actually in Wales, it's coming up a lot this evening. Uh, a young man came to me and said, I, I just want to know what God's will is. I said, look in the Bible. There you'll see God's will revealed to you. He said, but, you know, isn't there something else? No, what you need to know is here. It's in the Bible. This is God's revealed will to you. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 2 to 4. We read, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises, uh, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. Really, this passage just to encapsulate it, tells us that we have everything we need to know in God's word by his spirit uh, to know what his will is. Now, since this is the case, if God's will is to be done, we need to pray for understanding of that will in his word. The Baptist Catechism uh, addresses this question in uh, number 95 and it says how is the word to be read and heard that it may be effectual to salvation and we read that the word may become effectual to salvation we must attend with diligence preparation and prayer we must attend to it with diligence preparation and prayer receive it with faith and love laid up in our hearts and practice it in our lives if we're to know God's will, if we're to know the effectiveness and the power of God's word in our lives, we need to pray that we might see God's will revealed to us, we might understand that will re re revealed to us as we read it and particularly as we hear it preached. Uh, 
And here we can think of this in a couple of aspects. As we think about preaching and uh, preaching being a primary means of grace to us whereby God reveals his will and whereby we gain understanding of his word and will. We must pray for those who stand to minister God's word. For as God has called men to be preachers of that word, how are they going to faithfully declare that word and bring understanding of God's will to us? We say that they need to get in their study, they need to read their books, and they need to meditate upon it, they need training, etc., etc. And yes, of course, these are uh, great helps, these are necessary things. But ultimately, to preach the truth, even the most gifted of preachers, needs us to pray for them. We think of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 4 and verses 2 to 4. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open a door to us, a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in change, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul here is calling upon these believers for their vigilance, indeed for their earnest prayers, that he and his friends might have opportunities to preach the gospel. But more than this, he also asks them to pray that he might be able to make the gospel known as he ought to do. He, also, he asks for prayer in order that he might preach it rightly in terms of the words that he uses and the boldness that he has and the truth that he brings to the people. So, if we are to rightly pray, your will be done, we need to pray that we might know that will as we pray for the preacher and for that will to be revealed to us through the faithful preaching of the word. But also we need to pray for the hearers. It's equally important to pray for everyone who's listening to God's word and the revealed will of God brought to them. For we might hear the best sermon preached and yet fail to listen and fail to, to grasp hold of what's being said. So that's why so often Paul is found praying for the churches. Prayers like that which is found in Colossians 1 verses 9, I'll just stop at verse 11. He says, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Paul prays for knowledge and understanding of what? Of God's will. And so as we're thinking about the preaching of God's word and the reading of God's word, when you wake up on a Sunday morning, what are you going to pray for? Well, the good thing to pray for is this prayer, really. For you and your fellow believers, that you might know God's will as you gather for worship, as you hear the reading and the preaching of God's word, so that his will might be done here upon this earth so we need to pray that we might know god's will in the scriptures that it might be done upon this earth thirdly you might think this is a bit of a nuance but it's a is a different direction we need to pray the scriptures in the light of the understanding that we receive through the reading and preaching of the scriptures we should then pray the scriptures and pray that will that has been revealed to us that it might be done for in this way we can be sure that this is exactly what god wants to pray us to pray for of course it's true there's no problem praying for those who are unwell to be restored to health etc etc but ultimately we have no idea whether it's got a particular purpose to heal them at this particular time or to to sustain them through this trial that's why we have to submit to his will in that sense but when we pray the scriptures, we can be sure that this is God's will. We think of the example of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, he uttered 
quite a substantial prayer recorded for us in that chapter. And we'll just uh, have a few snippets from it to get a flavour of that prayer and the situation of the prayer. But we must find here that he was praying the word of God, the scriptures. So the first five verses we read, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the, the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. And we, we jump into uh, forward to verses 16 onwards. He then brings to conclusion his prayer, O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people are reproach to those, all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary which is desolate, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So Daniel knew from the scriptures, from uh, uh, the record uh, that we have of Jeremiah the prophet, that the people of God were to be in seventy to be seventy years in exile, and then the Lord would, in His mercy, uh, deliver them from that desolation. But as he considered this, he knew also, according to the scriptures that they needed to repent as a nation. They needed to seek God, and they needed to seek the forgiveness of God so that they would be restored to their own land. And so, according to God's will, he prayed that they might return home as a repentant remnant for the glory of God. David, Daniel, sorry, prayed according to to the scriptures and that's also what we find in the life of Jesus or indeed at the death of Jesus for in Luke 23 and verse 46 Jesus utters this prayer as he cried out with a loud voice father into your hands I commit your spirit and he's praying the scriptures He's praying Psalm 31 because he knows his God, as Psalm 31 tells him, is a fortress even to his suffering servant. And so he knew that according to the scriptures he was able to commit himself in death to his Father in heaven for it was his will to keep him. He was praying the will of God of God. So if we are to pray your will be done, we must pray the scriptures more. The recent youth conference we had in Ramsbottom, we were asked a question in the question and answer session that we had, um, really along the lines, of, I'm, I'm struggling to pray, have you got any advice to help me to pray? Um, I'm all right in, in reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures, uh, but I, I'm struggling to pray. And, and really, one of the big answers is to pray the scriptures. You think, well, what can I pray? How should I pray? Well, pray what you've read in the scriptures that, that day. Pray what you've heard in the preaching of the word of God on the Lord's day. Pray that. That is God's will revealed to you. Pray that that 
would be done in your life, in the life of others. At Ramsbottom, in the providence of God, uh, through COVID, we, we ha- moved our prayer meeting from a Sunday to uh, Monday evening. And one of the blessings in God's providence of that is that on a Monday evening, we can take what we have learned on the Sunday and pray that together as the church. And that's a real blessing for us to do that and to see that God's will might be done. And that is a, a great uh, thing that we must do. If we are to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we need to pray what the scriptures say and what that revealed will of God is. But fourthly, we need to pray for all that we need to obey God's will. Now, there is so much we must pray for in order to obey God's will. But let us focus upon just two things. Pray for faith. To do God's will takes a lot of faith. As we've seen, the world, the old nature, the professing church, and of course the world and the devil at times will cast doubt upon whether doing God's will is best. And they will even, as we've referenced, will oppose us and persecute us for it. So it can be a distressing thought, like with Christ in Gethsemane, to walk according to God's will. And so we need to pray for faith. To trust God that his will is best. That God knows what is good, what is best for us. Sometimes we can doubt, sometimes we can fear. We need to pray for faith to trust God's will. And so it's no wonder that Jesus' disciples asked for an increase in faith. And we identify with them in uh, Luke 17 and verse 5. They said just that, increase our faith. We struggle at times in terms of our trust of God. Let us pray that the Lord would increase our faith. That we might trust the will that he has revealed to us in the scriptures. But also we need to pray for strength. There's one thing we know about ourselves, it is that we are weak. Weak in body, weak in mind, weak in soul. We know that we are so weak that we can so easily fall into sin and crumble at the sight of opposition and fail to grasp the seriousness of obedience to God. We need strength to do God's will upon earth as it is in heaven. Now where can we get our strength from? You can't pop down the road to Tesco or whatever, can you? And get a ball of strength. We can't do that. An answer's already been given tonight. It's in the scriptures. It's from our God. It is only from God that we get the strength. Only from his scriptures. Only with the word of God and the spirit of God that we can find all that we need to do God's will. We must call upon God the strength of the omnipotent one to do that will. We think about one thing, one example. Contentment. That is God's revealed will to us, isn't it? Speaking with someone after service this morning about contentment and how tough it is to be content. We can only be content with the strength of God, according to his word. For Paul says in Philippians 4 and verses 11 to 13, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. What a great man Paul was, that inner strength to to be content. No. For he then goes on to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We can perform God's will. We can find the strength to do that, even to be content in the strength of Christ by his spirit through his word. So let's pray for the strength that God's will might be done.
So as we conclude, this is a difficult prayer to pray. Your will be done. But it's no less needful a prayer to pray than your kingdom come or hallowed be your name. But all these prayers must be prayed for us. That we might see and declare that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever to our God. So that God might be seen to be at work. That God would receive all the glory, not just today, but for the whole of eternity. So let's give ourselves to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.